This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. See my exclusive Nebula series, Mysteries of the Human Body, and get a year of Curiosity Stream for less than $15 when you click the link in the description. Last year, the film Don't Look Up premiered on Netflix to huge critical and audience acclaim. And just a few weeks ago, it was actually nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. Of course, now there's a little bit of a backlash against it, because I guess it got a little too popular. But in case you've been living under a rock or didn't see the Oscars, the movie's about a team of astronomers who discover an Earth-killing asteroid and then the frustrations they have trying to get the rest of the world to take it seriously. It's an obvious satire of climate change and more recently the, the pandemic, but it kind of takes a look at how we as a society have reacted to a long-term existential threat and then says, you know, what if we acted that way towards something much more near-term? Uh, like, how bizarre would that be? Now, for me anyway, it did that brilliantly. Um, in fact, I think some of it might have been a little too close to home for me, but uh, no, I think it did get a little bit of a backlash for being um, a bit too on the nose with its satire, a little bit self-congratulatory, and probably for that reason, it did lose at the Oscars, and, uh, and nothing else interesting happened that night. But the whole thing got me thinking about asteroid strikes, which are an actual threat, you know, and, and it got me wondering, like, what is our actual plan if a don't look up scenario happened? Now you might be surprised to hear this, but every day our planet receives visitors from outer space. I'm not talking about the greys or zeta reticulans. <laughs> Although who knows? No, I'm talking about meteors, and there's a lot more of them that hit the Earth than you might think. In fact, Earth is constantly being bombarded with material from outer space. Um, I ran across this fact, it's, this is mind-blowing to me. A hundred tons of material enters Earth's atmosphere every single day. A hundred tons. <laughs> and most of that burns up in the atmosphere, but every day 17 meteors make it to the surface. Actually, that's not true. If it lands on the surface, it's not a meteor anymore. It's a meteorite. Yeah, we tend to use the word meteor to describe any kind of rock flying through space, but actually, if it's a rock flying around in space, it's a meteoroid. Now, once it enters the atmosphere and burns up, that flash of light, that streak, that, that shooting star, that's actually a meteor. Once it hits the ground, it becomes a meteorite. You can think of it like other minerals that you find on the ground, like calcite, anthracite, meteorite. And then an asteroid is, is bigger than a meteoroid. It's like a, a, a tiny planet, a planetoid even. But yeah, somewhere on Earth every day, 17 of these things fall from the sky. Now, most of the Earth's surface is water, so most of them land in the drink, but every once in a while, they do hit land. And every once in a long while, they can do some real damage. Last year in 2021, I visited a meteor crater near Flagstaff, Arizona, also known as Behringer Crater. It's nearly a mile wide and 550 feet deep, and it was created by a meteor impact some 50,000 years ago. The meteor weighed hundreds of thousands of tons and released something like 9 to 10 megatons of TNT, which is roughly the same energy released in the Tonga explosion in January. The one that did this. And honestly, it's pretty mind-blowing to, to see in person, but especially as you're driving up to Meteor Crater and you just kind of start seeing random, out-of-place boulders and rocks that have just been strewn all over the place from the impact 50,000 years ago. But even still, this wasn't even that noteworthy as impacts go. Yeah, keep in mind, this is Meteor Crater. It was made by a meteor. Asteroids are bigger. According to NASA, a meteor the size of a football field strikes the Earth every 2,000 years or so. Asteroids large enough to cause extinctions and end civilizations come along like every few million years. Some of those are comets, but most of the largest impacts that we know about have been from asteroids. The most famous one, of course, is the one that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago and created the Chicxulub Crater in Mexico. Luckily, impacts at that scale are extremely rare. Um, in fact, there's only two craters on Earth that rival Chicxulub in size, and they're both over two billion years old. So yeah, it's incredibly unlikely that we're gonna see another planet-killing asteroid hit in our lifetimes. I mean, if our entire species makes it to the next one, it'll be pretty impressive. But an impact doesn't have to be a planet killer to ruin your day. In 2013, a meteor that fell over Chelyabinsk, Russia, injured 1,419 people. 7,200 buildings were damaged over an area of tens of kilometers, not by pieces of the meteor landing on it, but from the shockwave when it exploded in midair. In 1908, a much larger explosion devastated an area near the Tunguska River in Siberia. It more or less flattened 800 square miles of forest. Hundreds of reindeer died, but luckily no humans died. Unlucky if you're a reindeer. By the way, asteroids and meteors don't just like have it out for Russia or anything. Russia's just a giant country that covers a lot of land, a lot of it empty. If either of those had struck near New York or Paris, millions could have been injured, thousands could have been killed. So yeah, these things are a threat, even if a don't look up earth killer is unlikely anytime soon. 
And these threats are what NASA calls near-Earth objects, or NEOs. NASA defines an NEO as a comet or an asteroid that passes within 1.3 astronomical units of the Sun. An astronomical unit, or AU, is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so about 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. Uh, so basically anything near or inside of our orbit, NASA considers an NEO and takes particular interest in them. And that's not just because of the danger. Um, asteroids and comets are like time capsules from the birth of the solar system. Uh, it's thought that comets were formed in the same process that created the outer gas giants, and asteroids are from the process that created the inner rocky planets. So yeah, studying them is kind of like opening up a window to what the solar system was like four billion years ago. Of course, we'd rather go to them than have them come to us because of the whole... thing. Now, near-Earth objects that have trajectories that bring them uncomfortably close to Earth are upgraded to potentially hazardous objects, or PHOs, and now I'm hungry for Vietnamese noodles. And asteroids are by far the most common, so sometimes they're called PHAs for potentially hazardous asteroids. So PHOs of all kinds have been tracked by astronomers for years, but efforts got a major boost in 2005 when Congress passed a U.S. law directing NASA to find and identify 90% of NEOs over a certain size. And that, my friends, put NASA in the stroid hunting business. Of course, stroid hunting goes back a long way. Uh, the first asteroid was actually discovered in 1801, and it was given the name asteroid because it means star-like in a dead language people used to speak. By the year 1900, 464 asteroids have been discovered. By the year 2000, we had 108,066 in our catalog. It's almost like technology progressed over that time. But to give you an idea of how much our technology has continued to progress, in the last 20 years, NASA has discovered nearly 10 times as many asteroids. NASA's current count is over 1.1 million. That's some good story hunting. They range in size from a diameter of less than 10 meters to the largest asteroid in our solar system, Vesta, which is 530 kilometers. Uh, this is the asteroid that the Dawn Space Probe visited in 2011. Thankfully, Vesta is not considered an NEO. It's located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. That's where most of the solar system's asteroids hang out, though they have been known to migrate. Which brings us back to the danger asteroids. So first of all, the good news is uh, there are currently no known PHOs expected to hit us in the next 100 years. The not so good news is that there's still a lot that need to be found. Uh, NASA estimates there should be about 25,000 that fit the parameters of the 2005 directive, and so far they've found about 10,000. Now when you scale that up to asteroid size, NASA estimates there should be about 4,700 PHAs, and so far we've found 2,263 of them, at the time that I'm recording this anyway. So yeah, we've only found about half of the danger boys that should be out there. But the ones that we do know about tend to be on the larger side, so it's unlikely that another chicxulub style asteroid could sneak up on us. <laughs> but what if it does? Right? I mean, what, what, what if that one in a trillion, don't look up style scenario comes true? What are our actual plans? Well, in the US anyway, the plans fall to NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, which, yes, sounds like the group the men in black work for. By the way, the PDCO is the sort of umbrella office over the Near Earth Object Observations Program that's finding and tracking them in the first place. So the first thing the PDCO would do is send a probe to study the danger boy, because it's not just about the size and trajectory that matters, we also need to know its composition. Because some of these objects are solid iron, and others are essentially piles of rubble in space. Hitting one with a missile will have a different effect from hitting the other. Now in the case of a solid doom rock, there is the option of just nuking it. And my nipples got hard just saying that. But yeah, NASA has proposed this. But not because they want to blow it all to smithereens, but a nuclear blast could deflect it off course, which is all you really need to do. But a smaller asteroid might not need to go nuclear at all. You could just hit it with a conventional missile or projectile. Uh, the science-y term is kinetic impactor. But these aren't the best options for the rubble pile asteroids, because an explosion could just cause it to disperse into a cloud of rubble, much of it still directed towards Earth. It's like instead of getting hit with a bullet, you get hit with buckshot. It's still not much fun. So an alternative for the rubble pile doom rocks is landing a rocket on the surface and just pushing it off course. This could work for the solid ones as well. But let's not kid ourselves. We want to nuke it if we can. Oh, and if they could put like a CubeSat up there with a camera so we could see it. I I'm like, everybody was, uh, that would be the best live stream of all time. Now, if the asteroid's made of the right material, you might be able to deflect it with a laser. This is known as laser ablation. Uh, basically, the laser would just melt part of the asteroid's surface and the plumes of gas and ejected material would create enough force to slowly move the asteroid to a safe orbit. This might could even be done with a large mirror or Fresnel lens. Is it Fresnel or Fresnel? I never, it's a weird word. Fresnel, Fresnel, potato, tomato. But slowly is the operative word here. Uh, this is only an option if it's the right composition of materials and if we find it way in advance. 
Now, if we get really unlucky and a massive danger boy sneaks up on us, then deflection might not be an option. We may have to go straight to disruption. I mentioned earlier that if you blew up a rubble pile asteroid, you might just create a shower of smaller asteroids. Well, it turns out if you hit it hard enough, it might actually work. I'll be honest, when I started researching this, I really didn't think that this was a serious option. But there is a chance that a big enough explosion could turn a dangerous asteroid into space foam. One recent experiment simulated what would happen if a one megaton bomb were detonated near a 100 meter asteroid. Uh, they found that it would disperse 99.9% .9 of the asteroid's mass. Instead of a city killer, the study said they were left with a chunk no bigger than a chihuahua's head. Which is the weirdest measurement I've ever heard on this channel. Americans will do anything to not use metric. But it could work! And by the way, it doesn't have to just be one bomb. We could send multiple bombs. The first one breaks up the asteroid. The second one flings the pieces further off track. Repeat as needed. It's not like we don't have thousands of nuclear weapons just sitting around. The question is, could we pull that off in time? Back in April 2021, NASA conducted an exercise to put existing technologies to the test. They set up a fictional scenario involving an asteroid of unknown size and composition and gave international experts six months lead time. It uh, didn't go well. They concluded that no existing technology could do the job. No existing rocket could deliver a nuke in time. No existing spacecraft could collide with enough force. Six months, the experts concluded, is just simply not enough time. Now, opinions differ on how much time would actually be needed, but the NASA official who designed the scenario said five years at least. So, okay, so now would be a good time to remind you that um, the chance of this happening is extremely low. But still, we, we need more information on the PHOs that we know about. We need more tools to detect the PHOs. I mean, it's just like cancer. Early detection is key. Thankfully, some awesome new tools are on the way. 2026 is looking to be a banner year for planetary defense for a couple of reasons. The first being the Near Earth Object Surveyor. NEOS is a space-based infrared telescope specifically designed to help NASA finish its mission of cataloging 90% of large NEOs. It's been kind of stuck in development limbo since 2014, but it's recently cleared a major hurdle, so it appears to be on its way. And 2026 is when NASA expects to get data on the DART mission. Now, we heard a lot about this when it launched in November of last year, but DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, and it's the first time we'll actually attempt to redirect an asteroid using a kinetic impactor. Its target is a 160-meter-wide asteroid named Dimorphos that orbits a 780-meter-wide asteroid named Didymos. It's kind of like a moonlet. A mini danger boy, if you will. The idea is that DART will slam into Dimorphos at a blistering 6.6 .6 kilometers per second, which should move its orbit closer to Didymos. Currently, it takes 11 hours and 55 minutes to orbit, and it's expected that after the blast, it'll orbit every 10 minutes, and this will be detectable by Earth-based telescopes. Now, to be clear, neither Didymos or Dimorphos are a threat to Earth. This is merely just a test to provide data on asteroid deflection. So yeah, it launched last year, and it's set to collide in September of this year, 2022, and we'll be able to tell pretty quickly if it was successful. But in 2026, a pair of CubeSats developed by ESA will rendezvous with Dimorphos to examine the aftermath and uh, to figure out what went right, or what went wrong. Either way, it'll provide some insight that will help improve our deflection plans and might help astronomers sleep better at night. Because just a few months ago, January 2022, a discovery was made that probably caused a few sleepless nights. On January 6th, an asteroid called 2022 AE1 uh, was spotted in what appeared to be a collision course. And this was no mini danger boy. This asteroid was 70 meters wide, which is three times bigger than the Chelyabinsk meteor. This had a potential to be a Tunguska-level event, meaning something that could wipe out a city. It was quickly called the riskiest asteroid we'd found in a decade. Now, luckily, after some more observations, the collision was ruled out. But not before many a pair of underwear were soiled. Because, yeah, a year and a half is not nearly enough time to deflect it with our current technology. Now, I want to say that if something like that really did happen and we only had a year and a half to save ourselves, that it would clarify things and we would all get behind it and find a way to solve the problem. Recent events have given me reason to doubt that. Which I think is why Don't Look Up resonated so much when it came out. It's, it's unfortunately not that out of the question. You know, with the current wave of, of distrust and science that we're seeing lately, you know, would, would people be willing to do whatever they needed to to fund an emergency project to stop a threat that we can't see? One that's not even gonna affect us for a couple of years? Now, I should say the flip side of that argument is if you look at what happened with COVID, yes, there was a lot of denialism and a lot of, you know, people not getting behind it and whatnot, but the scientific community did come together and came up with vaccines in record time. It was kind of a massive undertaking, and really, we should be very proud of that. But what do you think? Do you think that we would split apart? Do you think that we would get behind it? Do you think we would find a solution to this? Think it's really not that big a deal? Tell me what you think down below. 
I know, I find this whole topic interesting because simultaneously a hundred tons of space stuff falls to Earth every day, but the chances of it being catastrophic is extremely small. But I guess that's just the reality of being on a rock flying through a vast galaxy filled with other tiny rocks. And a handful of danger boys. So unless you want to get pelted with a bunch of tiny rocks, I suggest you check out Curiosity Stream. That's what we in the industry call a hard sell. Get it hard, like a rock, like a hard rock falling from the sky, like a meteorite, I'll stop. Actually, speaking of meteorites, if you're into that kind of thing, a show you might want to check out is called Meteorite Men on Curiosity Stream. Meteorite Men follows the exploits of Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold, two meteorite hunters who travel the world searching for the biggest and baddest meteorites that have ever fallen to terra firma. And along the way, they get them analyzed by experts who teach all about where the rocks came from and what they can tell us about the origins of our solar system. Like, it's really amazing when you think about it that you can just find, you know, rocks in the ground that were once flying through the solar system for billions of years before they landed there. And some of them were loaded with precious gems. Some might say uncut gems. It's enough to make you want to dig out your old metal detector. And there are two whole seasons of Meteorite Men, but of course that's just one of thousands of documentaries you can find on Curiosity Stream from award-winning filmmakers from all around the world. No matter what you're into, science, technology, art, history, whatever you're curious about, you can stream it there. And of course, along with Curiosity Stream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming service I'm a part of, as well as many of your other favorite YouTube channels, where you can watch our videos ad-free, and that means both pre-rolls and these sponsor messages, like you're hearing right now. And of course, Nebula is the only place where you can watch my six-part series, Mysteries of the Human Body, which covers all the weird and surprising ways our bodies have kept us guessing over the years. Also, I just uploaded video versions of all my Conversations with Joe podcasts at Nebula, so you can go check those out too. And you, dear viewer, can get this bundle for 26% off an annual subscription, making it a grand total of $14.79 for an entire year for two streaming services. It's ridiculous. You'd be crazy not to take this. Hard sell. So if you're curious, just head over to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott to get started. Seriously, it's the best streaming deal that you're ever going to run across in the history of streaming deals. Uh, and I recommend both of them. I enjoy them both. So yeah, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. Do it. You'll like it. Big thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are forming an awesome community, keeping the lights on around here, and just being a great resource for me. I can't thank those guys enough. Anyway, there's some new people I need to shout out their names and murder the names real quick. We got Mo Islam, Holy Desade, <laughs> Joanna Cavallo, Ed Y, Evan Haugen, Shannon Burke, Katie Giddy, Maurice Townsend, Meshuri Al Sharif, Greg Morris, Jessica Roberts, Kyle DeSellitz, Bish. Carl Bolton and Ernest Joseph Olabaro. I think I got those right. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and all kinds of other cool stuff, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, um, we will think you might like this one, like this general area. So you can go look at that one or any of the others down on the side that have my face on them. And uh, if you like those and you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I'll come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Love you guys. Take care.